Well, Job has been sitting on that ash heap, listening to so many voices, and he's been enduring some false allegations and some stinging rebukes. But who is he truly wanting to hear from? The Lord, that's right. Because God is the only one that can answer his heart cry. Why? Why is this happening to me? And as I read Psalm 77 this week in my read through the Bible plan, I thought of Job crying out to the Lord. Listen to this. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Let's find the answer to that. Let's pray before we start. Lord, we do want to hear from you this morning. I pray that you would speak through your word. Incline our hearts to your testimonies. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. And I pray, Lord, that you would just grant that our eyes would be enlightened to know your steadfast love, to know and understand your gracious promises and your absolute sovereign control of our lives, and then to be able to hope and trust in you alone. We want to trust you, so I pray that you would do that work in our hearts right now this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Job longed to hear from the Lord. Eliphaz, you remember, dashed his hope by proclaiming back in chapter 5, Call now, is there anyone who will answer you? To which of the holy ones will you turn? And then in Job 23, Job lamented, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might even come to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. We've been in the unique spot of knowing some of the answers to Job's anguished cry of why as we listened into two conversations in the heavenly council meeting. We heard the non-answers of Job's three friends, and last week we heard from Elihu as he prepared Job to hear from the Lord. Elihu prophetically said in chapter 37, verse 5, God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. And then in the closing verses of chapter 37, he said, God is clothed with awesome majesty, the Almighty. We cannot find him. He is great in power. Justice and abundant righteousness he will not violate. Therefore, men fear him. Like Job, have you ever wanted to hear God speak? Have you ever cried out in desperation, Oh God, if only you would speak to me. If I could just hear your voice, please talk to me and not be silent. Well, we're going to see now in these chapters that God is not silent. He is not withdrawn, but God speaks. He speaks so that we might listen to him, to know him, to understand more about him, to love him, to live in joyful obedience to him. God speaks. Don't let that important point just be lost in our study this week. We have a God who speaks to us. He could have done this in so many ways. He could have written his words up in the clouds. He could have shouted it from the mountaintops. Or we know in this day of technology, he could have even downloaded a microchip in our brain that had his words on it. But he chose to do it a different way. He chose to speak by inspiring human authors, prophets as go-betweens, who would proclaim, thus saith the Lord and then write down those words. The author of Hebrews stated, Long ago, and at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken how? By his Son. That's right, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Unlike Job, we have the privilege and the awesome advantage to hear and to see God speak through Jesus. So if we're tempted to complain that God is silent, 
that we don't hear him speak or speak the way he wants or the way that we want, we should consider all the words that he has spoken, that he has written right here in this book. And we should be eager to study these words and to understand them. Our passage today, Job 38 through 41, is a climax of the book, and it contains Job's encounter with the Lord. This is the longest speech recorded in the Bible, God's speech anyway. These chapters are key to understanding the book as a whole. So we don't have time to, under, to understand and examine every sentence, but I encourage you to meditate on it, to study it, to linger over it, and ponder ways to apply it. Even if you're watching nature documentaries, you, you might be you know, cued in to say, God created this marvelous animal. Right? Well, in, uh, Job has been asking the why question, the why he is suffering. But God answers why Job can trust him. God answers the who question. God wants Job to see him for who he truly is the sovereign Lord of the universe. So let's begin, Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. I want you to notice a few things. His identity first. It is the Lord who is speaking. This is his covenant name, Yahweh, who revealed himself to Moses as I am who I am in Exodus 3. This name for God is found in the book of Job 32 times and in 23 verses, according to Blue Letter Bible. But we haven't seen this name for God since Job chapter 2. Job and his friends use the name God, which is Elohim, 17 times, and then the Almighty, which was Job's favorite name for God. This is Shaddai. He uses it 31 times, and it's in the main body of the book of Job, with one exception. And that is in Job chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, Job said, and, and I want you to hear the connections between Job 12 and Job 38. But ask the beasts, and they will teach you, the birds of the heavens, and they will tell you, or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare it to you. Who among all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord, Yahweh, has done this. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Second thing to notice, his way or his voice. Think about the ways the Lord interacted with people in the Old Testament. How did he come to Moses? In a burning bush, right? He met with the people at Mount Sinai. What did that sound like? Thunder and lightning and smoke right? He led Israel. How? Pillar of fire? Cloud? That's right. And now the Lord speaks out of a whirlwind, a storm. It's how he came to Adam and Eve in the garden after they had disobeyed. It was how he came to Ezekiel when he wanted to express his anger with Israel. And the Lord says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? So he's now going to answer Job. We could put answer in, in quotation marks here because he does it through questions. He asks Job a series of questions. And from the start, we see the patience of the Lord in answering a man who is without knowledge. This means he's ignorant. It doesn't mean he's malicious, but God has come to correct Job's thinking. It's important to remember that God is not angry with Job because of Job's unrighteousness. The Lord himself declared that Job was upright and blameless. So that's not the issue. The issue is Job's misunderstanding and misrepresentation of God. Satan's case, you remember, was focused on Job's motivation for being righteous. He predicted that Job would curse God and die if his blessings were removed. But Job has proved Satan wrong. But in the process, he has complained and accused and has shown that he doesn't understand completely who God is or his ways, and now the Lord has come to set Job and his friends straight. So picture this as the courtroom that Job has wanted. But instead of presenting his case as a defense attorney and putting God on the stand, 
and asking God questions. God is the one that cross-examines Job with more than 70 questions. And his intent is not to humiliate Job, but to open his eyes to who God really is. Job has some blinders on. He's in the dark because he needs knowledge and he needs wise counsel from God. He needs to know that God is in charge and God knows what he is doing. So he says, dress like a man. This is, means to get ready for battle, to brace yourself. And God says, I will question you and you make it known to me. So the Lord begins this courtroom drama by bringing his witnesses to testify. And the first witness up on the stand is Genesis 1. So this is point number two on your handout. God created it all, and God controls it all. There are echoes of Genesis all over these chapters. God made it, and it was good. God created it. God calculated. God constructed. God rules. So in these opening sections, the focus is on the physical universe. So God quizzed Job on an array of scientific topics. Astronomy, cosmology, meteorology, oceanography, and finally, zoology. In verses 4 through 7, he likens creation to a building whose architect and master builder rejoice when it is finished. And Job can't possibly know how God created it all, the detailed measurements of the Earth's foundation. Why? He wasn't there. But who was there cheering God on? Verse 7, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I thought of the song, indescribable, uncontainable. You put the stars in the sky, and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All-powerful, untamable, awestruck. We fall to our knees and we proclaim, we humbly proclaim, you are amazing, God. And in the class email, I'm going to send you a link this week so that you can see a Desiring God a speaker, Louis Giglio, who came 10 years ago, and he did a mashup with his iPad of stars singing along with whales singing and then inviting us all to worship. And I hope you'll take 10 minutes to watch that this week. It's amazing. So hearing from the Lord should lead us to worship and to trust. Now in verses 8 through 11, we see an image that he uses here of the sea. In the Old Testament, the sea is an image of wickedness and chaos. And we see a hint here that God is restraining evil. How does the sea know its boundaries and keep from flooding the land? Well, God made it. God birthed it, and he controls it. He, the sea obeys God's limits. In verse 11, we see his beautiful instructions to the sea. Thus far you shall come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. In verses 12 through 15, God says, How about the sun, Job? Do you control the dawn? Well, the morning light exposes evil deeds. Every time the sun rises, we are reminded that darkness, evil, wickedness cannot overcome the light of the world. Recall John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. God never sleeps or slumbers. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He continually provides for us. The sun is a reminder of that every morning. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new Every morning, great is your faithfulness. In verses 16 through 18, we see that God created and rules over the most extreme depths of the sea and over death, which Job has talked about 
but obviously did not know that much about. Like Job, we cannot fathom the depths and the heights of God's creation. When God finally spoke to Job, his questions were rhetorical. Job was not supposed to answer, but to learn from them. Repeatedly, God is saying, was that you, Job? No, that was me. Was that you, Job? No, that was me. The point that the Lord is making to Job is that his understanding is severely lacking. This also should lead us to worship, as Paul erupted at the end of Romans 11. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable are his ways. Every question of can you, have you, did you, would be answered with a resounding no. Job can't do what God does. Job can't see what God sees. Job can't possibly know what God knows. Every question of who did is answered with, not me, you. You did it, God. So the Lord did not tell Job why he suffered what he did, but he did share his intimate and expansive knowledge of every aspect of creation. All of it, everything that happens on it, over it, under it. A modern paraphrase might be, chill, Job. Relax. I've got this. You can trust me. In verses 19 through 21, God asks, where does light live? How about darkness? Well, God created it and he rules over it. Isaiah wrote in chapter 45, I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light. I create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. In verses 22 through 38, the Lord asks Job to look up and to consider the sky. From the clouds that are nearby to the faraway planets and stars, consider who is in charge. We were in awe this week as the heavens declared the glory of God, right, in the total eclipse. As God demonstrated this winter in Minnesota, he creates the snow and he uses the snow for his purposes. He rules over the rain, over the lightning, ice and frost, every aspect of the weather. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go or sees heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night? None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Nestled in this section on the clouds, in verse 36, we read, Who has put wisdom in the inward parts? or given understanding to the mind. Is the Lord maybe hinting at the real issue at heart here? Is it not God who puts wisdom within us, the wisdom to face life? And who gives understanding to our minds? We can be confident that the wisdom of God that created and controlled and sustains all of creation is at work in our suffering. Yes, God created it all, and he controls it all. We're still hearing echoes of Genesis. Do you remember on day five in Genesis 1, God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth and across the expanse of the heavens. So God created this great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Every living creature, from the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation reveals God's majesty. 
So we've moved from the big stuff of chapter 38 now into the animals in chapter 39. At this point, you might be wondering, what do the animals have to do with Job's suffering? What might Job be learning about the Lord? Well, certainly that he is powerful and majestic and wise beyond our comprehension. We've gotten that point. But here the Lord is also demonstrating that he is also compassionate, even toward beasts, even the wild ones that live beyond human observation in places Job can't see, the wild mountain goats, the wild donkey, the wild ox. Life and death is in God's hands. God knows just what they need, and he cares for them, and he knows what we need. I thought of the other old hymn, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Back in chapter 3, Job had felt hedged in by God. Do you remember? He felt trapped by his suffering, so that he had lost purpose for life. But here, in chapter 38, we see that God is the one who hedges in the sea. He sets limits on the sea to keep it under control. Back in chapter 10, Job had accused God of oppressing him while favoring the wicked. But quite the opposite is true. God is the one who exposes the wicked each dawn. Back in Job 10, 16, Job had accused God of relentlessly hunting him down like a lion, which doesn't paint a very positive picture of his relationship with the Lord. But now God says that he does hunt down prey for the lion, showing his providential care. Back in chapter 19, Job lamented that God didn't hear his cry. But God reminds Job that even he even hears the cries of the young ravens when they're hungry. If God hears the cries of birds, he hears Job and he hears us. Job was right in that he did not suffer because of his sin, but we now know that not everything Job said in his suffering was true. If Job can't understand the wonders of the animal world, how could he understand God's ways and purposes in his life, especially purposes in suffering? When Job did not understand the why, he needed to be quiet and trustingly submit to God. God has no obligation to explain his actions to Job. He is not accountable to Job. He alone is sovereign and has the right to do with his own whatever he pleases. Romans 9.20 asks, But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? This is one of the lessons that Job is learning, that he is the potter and that we are the clay. He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. He's the master, we are his servants. He is the father and we are his children. God is God and we are not but we can trust him and we can humbly worship him. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name. Give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. This is Psalm 115. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Now let's read Job 40 verses 1 through 2. And the Lord Yahweh said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. So here we see all three names for God. We see Yahweh, Lord in all caps. We see God, Elohim, and we see the Almighty, which is Shaddai. God has not answered Job's big why question, but he's making it very clear to Job who he is. Job is getting the message. Job's response is to put his hand over his mouth. He says, Behold, I am of small account. The NIV translates this unworthy. Other translations say insignificant. He says, I have spoken once and I will not answer. 
twice, but I will proceed no further. Job has realized how little he knows, and he has spoken more than he should, and he's moved to silence. This is the wisest thing he could have done. God again challenges, challenges Job speaking out of a storm again. He says, dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? The NIV says, would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? What would happen if Job were to take God's place for a day. That's what we get at in verses 9 through 14. And as you follow along, I'd like to read it in the Net Bible, which just gets a little different nuances. Verse 9, Do you have an arm as powerful as God's? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself then with majesty and excellency, and clothe yourself with glory and honor. Scatter abroad the abundance of your anger. Look at every proud man and bring him low. Look at every proud man and abase him. Crush the wicked on the spot. Hide them together in the dust. Imprison them in the grave. Then I myself will acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. So the Lord's first speech focused on God's counsel and his wisdom. Now the second speech these questions zero in on the issue of God's justice, whether Job has the power to orchestrate events in the world in order to carry out his purposes. Does he have power like God to establish justice? So God challenges him to put on his God clothes and to act like God, to show God how he would govern the world. Would he deal justly? Would he do that? Would he deal with the problems of evil? God is saying, go ahead, Job, try to run the universe and do a better job than me. And then God will even acknowledge that he's not needed. Job can save himself. Of course, the point here is that Job does not have God's power or majesty or wisdom or glory or splendor. He can't carry out God's justice, and God alone can save him. We see a shift now at verse 15. You see that? Behold, behemoth. Well, the Lord has exposed Job's complaints. He's silenced his accusations. Back in chapter 28, verse 28, we read that the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And now the Lord is going to show Job what that looks like. We need to put down the mirror, as Brian Tabb said, right? And we need to pick up our binoculars. We need to quit gazing at ourselves here. And we need to put our gaze on God. Wise people seek the Lord. Now the Lord shows us the way forward by describing two more creatures, a land beast, behemoth, and a terrifying water beast, Leviathan. And as you might expect, scholars are all over the map on what these creatures mean. Are they actual or are they mythological? Or are they literal animals with mythological metaphors? Um, is the Lord making essentially the same point as he made in his first speech, that he created behemoth with his strength and he can tame the crocodile? Um, there seems to be a little bit more here than that. We'll see again next week that the second speech from the Lord elicits an even stronger reaction from Job. Job is in awe, and he worships, and he repents, and that response we didn't see in the first speech. So that's our first clue that they mean a little bit more than literal animals. And also, if God is saying, well, Job, you haven't created a hippopotamus or tamed a crocodile, then it's a bit anticlimactic. The skeptic George Bernard Shaw said in one of his plays, God really has to do better in explaining the problem of evil than to say, you can't make a hippopotamus, can you? So back in Job 3.8, Job's first lament, he asks those who are ready to rouse up Leviathan to curse the day of his birth. Scholars agree that he's not talking about a crocodile back in uh, Job 3. 
to rouse up Leviathan is to call upon God's enemy, the prince of darkness, to come and to undo what God has done in creation. So Leviathan is not just a crocodile back in, in uh, Job 3. It seems more likely that he's more than a crocodile here in Job 41. You saw in your homework this week that Leviathan is referred to as God's arch enemy, the prince of the power of evil, the great dragon, even Satan, or as Jesus said, the God of this world. So Leviathan points to wickedness, terror, hideous evil. God is addressing the problem of sin and suffering in the world. Job has questioned the justice of God, and God has challenged him to try his hand at that task. Some scholars believe that behemoth uh, stands for death, like death, like you've seen it portrayed, like the Grim Reaper with the sickle. But whatever behemoth is, the major focus of the speech is on Leviathan. He gets a full chapter, 34 verses, and this is a rather unusual conclusion to the Lord's speech. Well, God's challenge to Job is filled with some irony. Did you notice that this week? And some dark humor? In the opening verses of Job 41, he says to Job, go ahead, try fishing for Leviathan and see if you can reel him in. And he continues by asking him if he would think about putting him on a leash and bringing him home for dinner. And no, Leviathan is not a cute pet that he would bring home for his little girl. In the same way, Job should not want to battle cosmic evil on his own. Job needs to know that the Lord who created Leviathan in all of his terrifying strength is the only one that is strong enough to control him. Only God can keep Leviathan on a leash. And one point that the Lord is making here is that Leviathan is a creature. He is a created thing. God made him, and God controls him. He is on God's leash, even if he cannot be on Job's leash. So Leviathan is terrifyingly strong, but God is stronger still. Christopher Ashe wrote in his commentary, As Job suffers, his greatest and deepest fear is that the monster who attacks him is unrestrained, that the attacks will go on forever with unrelieved ferocity, and that the monster has been given a free hand, unlimited access to Job and his life. He's afraid that there is no sovereign God who has evil on a leash, but there is. And when Job grasps that, he is filled with awe. End of the quote. Well, we know from chapters 1 and 2 that Satan is indeed on a leash. He obeys to the letter. Satan, Leviathan, is a terrible beast, but he cannot go one inch beyond the leash that the Lord keeps him on. Therefore, we can trust him. So let's move into a few applications here. Number one, the bad news is the world is more terrifying than we think. There are terrible and terrifying powers of evil in our world. Paul says in Ephesians 6 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. These powers are completely and utterly beyond our control. But God is infinitely more aware of the suffering and the injustice and the wickedness in the world than we are. So we can trust him. It's also true that God is so much greater than we realize. God displays his greatness and his wisdom by creating the world and everything that's in it. And in the same way, God has designed you. Do you sense the greatness of his perfect design in your life, giving you your unique gifts, your unique temperament, personality, even your unique history? We really have nothing to say before such a great creator. We have no defense, no self-justification, no striving to preserve ourselves and our reputation, just nothing. 
And when we have nothing to say, we should say nothing. But instead, listen to God who lovingly speaks to us by this, these descriptions of his greatness. We ought to worship him and trust him. Number three, submit to God's wise plan and purposes. We will not always understand his ways, but we will be able to take comfort in knowing his steadfast love, his faithfulness, his character, and his wise purposes, even as Pastor Sam said so beautiful, beautifully this past Sunday. We can trust in our God and his steadfast love. So let the Bible be your ultimate standard and filter for your thoughts and emotions. Let your worldview be shaped by what God has said about himself instead of what your friends think or feel about God. Knowing who God is and knowing our place should change our attitude and our heart posture toward God to move us to humility and to submission. That's hard, isn't it? Because we want to be in control. We want to know what is happening and why in our lives. But reflecting on God's wise plan and purposes, even in light of our suffering, ought to move us to trust him more. I want to show you this book. This is really a treasure. This is written by Johnny Erickson Tata, and it's called Songs of Suffering, 25 Hymns and Devotions for Weary Souls. And it's a beautiful book. And Johnny writes from personal experience after spending more than 50 years in a wheelchair as a quadriplegic after a diving accident. And I want to read to you one paragraph from this book, if you'll permit me time. This, it's just so beautiful. She said, as it concerns God's sovereign plan, your response matters. God invites you to play a role in redeeming your suffering by trusting him. Wisdom is not the ability to comprehend life's puzzle. It's not knowing how to make everything fit. Wisdom is trusting God when, especially when, all the pieces go missing. Work on that puzzle and you will be in perfect conformity with the purpose of his will. When his will for you, or when his will for your shattered life is complete, Christ in you will be far more dazzling than you dared imagine, far more beautiful than you ever dreamed, and far more satisfying than you ever hoped. It's a beautiful book, and it's filled with hymns and devotions. So number four, trust, even if you struggle to do so. We do struggle to trust him now, but we know from his word, from testimonies of others, and from our own experiences that he is good, he is wise, he is kind, trustworthy, and so much more. So encourage one another to trust him. You have a quote on your handout from John Piper, and I'm just going to read a couple sentences from it. He says, those who trust his goodness and his wisdom in that sovereignty find the greatest strength and even joy through the hardest seasons of life. The very sovereignty that brings our sufferings is the same sovereignty that enables us to be confident that God can save us in them, from them, according to his wise and loving purposes. And number five, someday we will see more clearly. There is coming a day where there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. And our summer Bible study is titled, Glory, Steadfast Hope in Your Heavenly Home. So I hope you will join us this summer as we examine very precious promises in our glorious hope of heaven even as Job said in chapter 19, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. So although now we only know in part, then we will know in full. We will know exponentially more than we do now. And a lot of things will make more sense then that don't make sense now. And maybe some of you have ever wondered if in heaven we might find out things that we didn't know, like how a frustrating delay kept us from a fatal accident, or 
how disappointments have ultimately guided us to uh, a different uh, you know, path in our life. We see glimpses of things now. As Job said in chapter 26, 14, he said, we see the edges of God's ways. I'm confident that God is doing so much more in our lives than we even realize here and now. Job didn't know about that heavenly cabinet meeting. And I don't know if we'll ever understand all the mystery of God, even in heaven. But when we see him, we will fall on our knees in worship. And when we see him, whatever doesn't make sense here won't matter. Our faith will be sight and our trust will be perfect in that day. And then number six, someday God will destroy the powers of evil once and for all. The very power and wisdom of love that governs our sorrows now is the same power that will deliver us in God's all-wise timing. In verse 19 of chapter 40 here, Job says about Behemoth, he says, He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. God will deal with ultimate death and suffering and pain in that day. He started at the cross, right? Colossians 2 tells us he, Jesus, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. But in Revelation, we see a picture of what worship will be like when evil is ultimately triumphed over. And we will sing the song of Moses. It says in Revelation 15, 3, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Did you hear all those names for God there? Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your patience with Job. We thank you for your patience with us. You show us such mercy and grace even when we question you, when we rebel against you. But your faithfulness is so great, and great is your wisdom, great is your goodness. Would you help us to say that and to believe it even when we don't feel it? Lord, thank you that we can trust you with whatever is going on in our lives. Help us to know that you are the God who is in control of everything that we might fear you. Help us, Lord, to remember that your steadfast love and your faithfulness help bring it to our minds. Help us to depend on that when our emotions get the best of us. May we be growing toward more perfect trust even now as we behold you through your word. We want to trust you, our great God the Almighty, the Lord, Yahweh. Help us to trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.